Mm -hmm. Okay, a warm welcome to everyone this evening. Welcome to our inspiring webinar on advanced clinical practice within the care of the older person. My name's Ellie, I'm the Welsh Regional Rep in Agile. So we have four speakers tonight talking about their role within the advanced clinical practice. So after each presentation, we're going to allow some time for some questions. Okay, just, um, just some housekeeping rules. Not sure. Verity, I can't click onto the next slide. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Just some housekeeping rules. So make sure your microphones are on mute. The session is being recorded and put your um, questions in the chat box. Slides and the YouTube video will be sent out after the presentation. And once you've completed the feedback form, we'll um, be able to give you a certificate and it'll be automatically generated. Okay. So just to make you aware of some benefits about joining Agile. So it's a great opportunity to meet and to network with people nationally. There's regular webinars and learning events and it helps stay on top and up to date with the latest research. It's only £25 a year, and at the bottom there, it's got some links about how to join. So what I'm going to do now is pass you on to Melissa, who's going to introduce the first speaker. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Melissa. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, thank you. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Jasmine Morris, and she's an advanced clinical practitioner in same-day emergency care at Great Western NHS Foundation. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> um, so, as I've just been introduced, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> still recovering from COVID. My name's Jasmine. Um, as has been mentioned, I'm an advanced clinical practitioner. I can't see my slides at the moment. No, you should, I'm, I'm sharing them, so you should be able to see them on the screen. Oh. I can't see them. What I'll do, look, I've got them open on another screen, so I can sort of run through and say, um, see, so yeah, I'll see yeah, this evening going to be... Just tell me next slide, Jasmine, when okay. you're ready, okay? I'm going to be talking about my ACP journey. So if we can go on to the next slide, which should be like my path to my current role. Yeah. Um. So essentially I qualified as a physio from Coventry University in 2014 um, and then started as a band five rotational physio uh, at the Great Western, where I um, did rotations in orthopedics, community, uh, the acute rehabilitation team, and then moved on to the front door team in April of 2016, which is where I was successful in getting a band six post. Worked there for a couple of years before going on to um, get a clinical specialist uh, physio post in 2019, which is essentially where my ACP journey started. I started to have a think about what I could do differently um, compared to the other sort of uh, band sixes within the team. Um, and the, our front door team at the Great Western is a joint physio and OT team. So there were different skill sets that we could utilise. I then started my master's in 2020, where I completed my first modules um, and did the majority of my training uh, in my front door role in the emergency department. As I was nearing the end of my degree, um, unfortunately, there wasn't the opportunity to continue the role I was doing at that time. Um, and so I went to same day emergency care, which is a bit more ambulatory and less frailty, um, but with some views for some scope for things to change in the future. Um, and I completed my master's in March of 2023. Um, so if we can go on to the next slide. So just going to do a quick overview of the modules that are incorporated in the master's that I did. So I did mine at the University of West of England. So did a pathophysiology and diagnostic reasoning module to consolidate that medical knowledge um, and think about the investigations needed to, um, to make decisions about uh, patient care and what we were going to do going forwards. Um, my advanced practice and clinical assessment module was a 40 credit module. Um, so recap some of the pathophysiology, but also was primarily focused on doing a medical assessment 
um, so that I could safely assess patients. Um, a compulsory part of modules is of, of a uh, master's is leadership. So I did that in 2021, and then followed by the other sort of 40 credit module, which is a big part of your and the biggest work um, that I sort of found was the non-medical prescribing. Um, there are limitations from physio for physio prescribers in terms of controlled drugs, but within my role now, I prescribe anti-epileptics, antibiotics, pain relief, um, all sorts for, for patients, blood thinners and, and everything. Um, then I did my research module and then sort of throughout 2022, alongside my prescribing and my research, I did my evidencing work-based learning module, which was about the role development, um, which I'll come on to a bit, in a bit more detail in a few minutes. Um, the next slide just shows a couple of other courses that I did. So I did the Edward Jenner online leadership course, um, which I found really useful to consolidate. Um, I actually did it prior to my start of my master's, but it was a gave me a lot of, of knowledge to take forward uh, to prepare me for my master's module. It's part of the NHSI Frailty Collaborative in 2019. Then have done a couple of um, older persons um, online modules. Uh, these were day-to-day -day courses, one up in York and one in London, I believe. Uh, the next slide just gives the overview. I know it's not necessarily relevant to everyone, but the advanced practice um, masters at UE. So to get the full masters, you need to do 180 credits, but there are options at 60 and 120 credits to get a postgrad certificate or a postgraduate diploma. Um, and I think this is something that's a very good starting point for those clinical skills, if that's how you want to make sure that you maintain your physio identity um, and those core physio skills. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. So as I mentioned, this my uh, sort of ACP journey all started with my role within the front door team. So it's an admission avoidance team that works across the acute medical units and the emergency department at the Great Western. Like I mentioned, it's a team of physios and OTs um, and therapy assistants. Um, and we will see any patient that presents the emergency department that is identified to have a therapy need. So it could be a younger person with longstanding um long-standing uh, mobility issues it could be your typical sort of older faller um, so the key parts of the role are the history gathering um, early mobility reviews uh, your collateral history and then establishing a plan for discharge um, so if we go on to the next slide the the sort of key thing that helped me find what I wanted to do from an ACP perspective was the implementation of our paramedic handover service. Um, so in 2020, around the time COVID was hitting, um, our emergency department at the Great Western at that at that period was uh, not as busy or nowhere near as busy that had been previously. So thought it was a good opportunity to look at service improvement. So we had a, a senior therapist located in the emergency department listing into paramedic handovers. Um, so what we could do from that was gather first-hand information from the paramedics about the environment, had the um, any early identification of safeguarding concerns, actually had the patient already been up and mobilising at their usual level of function. Um, and often from that, if we can ensure that there were no red flags to mobility, we could mobilise patients to do the transfer from trolley to trolley or to the toilet or whatever was needed at that time with a plan to start to formulate an idea of what that exit strategy would be from hospital. So within that one month pilot, there were 93 patients seen, 36 were discharged home directly from the emergency department um, of the others that were admitted, 90% left hospital with that plan that was formulated by the therapist on that initial assessment. Um, and so if I'm going to the next slide, my sort of initial role um, stepping into ACP practice was thinking, how could I 
take that one step further. So there are lots of patients that at paramedic handover, it was very apparent that they needed an X-ray of a, a wrist or a shoulder um, or, you know, some they had some injury. Um, or for some people, actually, the story was that it was a bit more of a social type admission. They maybe had a bit of a chest infection, but medically that wasn't medically. They didn't necessarily need to be admitted to hospital. So from listening into that and starting to formulate a bit of an idea of could this person be ready to go home in the next day or two? I thought, what skills can I add to my you know, what what skills can I get to try and streamline this process for patients? So the initial role was to, um, from paramedic handover, listen into the handover, go in and see and assess the patient from both a medical and a therapy perspective. And using that joint information, start to formulate a plan. Obviously, for some patients, it's very apparent that they were not very well and they needed to come into hospital. Um, and so the therapy aspect stepped back a little bit but at least you had that uh, hopefully a, a good social history to base that sort of onward steps for on for the uh, for the patient um throughout my role i was supervised by an ed consultant um and so every patient so initially throughout my modules was being supervised for clinical assessments then once they were happy with that i would go and assess a patient go chat back to the consultant or the senior doctor um, to say this is what I think what investigations might be required um, throughout my training as well I also um, got signed off to do um, imaging requesting so uh, x-ray requests and CT head requests but early on in my training all that imaging requesting was done by by the doctors so I had that sort of safety net to make sure I was requesting appropriate imaging um, and combining those two things to try and, like I said, to try and come up with a, a plan. Um, so the next slide uh, just sort of shows the four pillars of advanced practice. So um, those are clinical practice. So thinking about provision of your high quality healthcare, facilitating learning, um, and that is learn your own learning, but also learning for your peers, for your and colleagues, for doctors. Um, and so actually, in that case, I was looking at developing a nurse, uh, developing training sessions for my front door colleagues to sort of build or share some of the medical knowledge I'd gained, which would help them in their their roles to try and identify which patients might be medically fit for discharge a little bit sooner. Uh, leadership. Um, and so in this case, it was sort of the development of a new role and how I could use those, oh, use my skills. Don't do that. Please don't touch the screen, OK? Um, I just tried to see that. your brother. Let's go brush teeth and see your brother. And then the oh, other um, oh, pillar of evidence, so research and development. So the use of evidence to inform your practice. So throughout this, I was doing data collection, uh, getting feedback on the, the process and sort of doing informal and formal PDSA cycles to try and look and see how we can improve things. So... As I mentioned, my evidencing work-based module was, evidencing work-based learning module was about this role development. Um, and so the next slide gives a very, very brief overview of the data. Um, my, the work that I did is soon to be uh, published in the Journal of Advancing Practice, if anyone wants to have a look at it in a bit more detail, but it was looking at those patients that were seen and assessed by the advanced practice physiotherapist i.e. me, um, compared to previously where patients would arrive in the emergency department, be seen by an ED clinician, and then referred on for a therapy assessment. Um, and essentially, very brief overview, essentially the there was a significant time saving. So when they were seen by the advanced practice physiotherapist, the assessment time was just over two hours per patient. Uh, equating to 3,075 minutes, which is roughly 50 hours, I believe. Um, and then if they were seen by an ED clinician for the assessment and then had a therapy assessment on top of that, that was 255 minutes. But there was also roughly an hour and 40 minute wait in between that referral time and the therapy assessment taking place. Um, 
which was dependent on obviously the needs, the other uh, medically fit patients within the department, the needs of the service from the therapy perspective. Um, this work sort of looked at average wait times to be seen, how long patients were in the department, but tried to focus in on the aspects and elements we could or I could control. Um, so it's a, a significant time saving for patients. Um, the next slide has just got a sort of example of the, the work. So um, I saw a 79 year old lady who had come into ED after being found on the floor by her daughter. Um, from the history gathering, she had um, been bending over to pick something up. She just overbalanced, so she had no concerning features, no dizziness, no loss of consciousness, chest pain or palpitations. Um, and she didn't hit her head when she fell. On the on examination, she had some tenderness in her hip and was unable to do a straight leg raise. Um, and uh, so from that, uh, we got an X-ray of her pelvis, which showed no abnormality. Um, and she had a CT of her head, I believe, because she was slightly confused. Um, and I think she might have been on some blood thinners. So just as a sort of precautionary measure, she had a CT head, which also showed no abnormality abnormality um she had relatively unremarkable bloods a sort of slight kidney injury um probably from dehydration and being on the floor for sort of 12 hours um from the assessment and throughout the consultation the patient was very very adamant that she wanted to return back home but her daughters were both quite concerned due to some gradual decline in her cognition um also combined with some slightly increased alcohol use um and which was having an, an impact on her cognition and her function. She was previously living alone in a house with downstairs living, no package of care um, and struggling with the toilet transfers. So once the x-ray had been completed, uh, she had a mobility assessment. She was independently mobile with a Zimmer frame and uh, gave her a freestanding toilet frame, a commode for overnight um, and liaised with the social work team. And at the time of this study, um, the capacity for social care was slightly better. And so she was actually discharged home um, later that evening with a package with family support with a package of care due to start the following day or the social work assessment to start the following day. Um, and so for all of that assessment, including her her imaging, her um, discussion, social uh, discharge planning discussions, she was in the emergency department for a total time of three hours and 22 minutes. So sort of a, a good example of where things had mm -hmm. had gone to plan. Um, so the next slide, sorry, I don't know how I'm doing for time, is just a for my ACP journey. I think the key factors for me is that I had a clear vision of what I wanted my end goal to be um, and the role that I wanted to try and implement. And I've sort of worked backwards from that, thinking, okay, this is what I want to achieve how do I go about that and sort of work backwards to then problem solve and say, okay, I need to get this qualification. I need to do this training. I need to speak to this person and this person. Um, I had a very supportive line manager who allowed time for training and I flexed my time throughout this training from my front door role and my trainee ACP role. So I did two to three days in each role excuse me, dependent on um, uni modules, staffing within the front door team, but also trying to get make sure I had that clinical exposure. Um, having regular clinical supervision was a challenge. I was fortunate that I had an ED consultant who was sort of assigned to me so I could meet with them monthly, um, but it did take uh, encouragement to make sure that sort of stayed throughout my training. Accessing peer support, was difficult and I think is still something that can be challenging at times because there aren't a lot of physios in, in ACP roles. Um, and I think flexing across two different roles at the time I found difficult because, I, you know, on a Monday I could be front door team in ED, on a Tuesday I could be an ACP in ED. And so there was some confusion around, around the role. Um, particularly in early stages of my training. And it required quite a lot of planning ahead for the modules and what time I had available to make sure I could get the things done that I needed to do. Um, and then the next slide 
just a bit more sort of summary. Um, I found it a very, very exciting but challenging journey. Um, sort of touched upon a couple of the challenges in terms of peer support. Getting that backing from your line managers is crucial. Um, and I think another thing I'd say I've learned from this now is that, I've, unfortunately, the role I had envisioned hasn't quite or hadn't come together by the time I was um, completing my master's. But making sure you can keep hold of your core physio skills, because at the moment I've been, um, you know, my, my other skills are being utilised to the max, particularly during the doctor strikes. I've sort of been working a much more a junior doctor type role uh, rather than utilising that what makes me unique as an advanced clinical practitioner is that ability to see and assess older patients. Um, there is a There was a significant time saving made in the assessment of patients in the emergency department. Um, and within the Great Western, we've got an upcoming merge of our same day emergency care and medical assessment unit. Um, so I'm going to explore frailty assessments again in the acute medical unit and hopefully can justify and start to get some of my more, much more physio back into my role. Um, there's definitely work to be done around streamlining the process of AHPs and physios doing ACP training. Um, and because there are limited roles at the moment, like I said, I've had to take a step away from physio. Um, but and I'm part of a, a sort of a small ACP um, physio forum where we found that we're encountering different diff this sorry similar challenges in terms of making sure we keep our physio identity. Um, Health Education England had done a case study on my role. So if anyone wanted to have a look a bit more detail about the work that I did, the link is at the bottom. Um, and then that is it. So final slides, are there any, are there any questions at all? Yeah, so um, I've got, um, sorry, um, I've got a question. It's Ellie. Um, you know, it is, it is like nerve wracking almost, isn't it? Stepping away from that physio role and especially like um, prescribing and like, how do you, how do you like, I don't know, cope with that pressure or that, you know, it's another level of responsibility again, isn't it? It is. And I think throughout every career step I've had so far, I've had imposter syndrome, Um, you know, going from band five to band six and, and throughout the, the different bandings. Um, It's trying to look at, for me personally, what I can control and what I can't control, you know, I need to be confident in my assessment skills. And so it is a case of learning by doing. So the mm -hmm. same way that doing your MSK assessment, you know, or your ward assessment of going through that social history, the more you do it, the more it consolidates it. And so if you can get your, as with most other things, if you've got that solid foundation of your history, those other bits you can problem solve. And I've been lucky to work within teams that are supportive. And actually in the same day emergency care team I'm in now, there's actually 13 ACPs. Um, I'm the only physio, there's two paramedics and nine nurses, but it means you've got other people to bounce ideas off of. And we've all experienced the same freakouts about what we're doing. And so I think it's, there's not one way and there's certain days where I've left work and I thought, oh my, have I done the right thing with that patient? And I, I'm up all night worrying about them going the next day. I worry more about some of the people that I send home because they're, mm -hmm. I know I wouldn't do make a decision that I wasn't happy with, but I think it's just trying to engage that rational part of your brain that is, mm -hmm. you know, that I, I wouldn't have been signed off and doing these things if I wasn't competent. I think also, though, having that in the back of your mind of there's potential for me to make a mistake is what keeps you at being a safe practitioner, because you then thinking through and, you know, doing that rationale for, for the, your decision making. Um, there's another question for you, Jas, from Adrian. He's asking, ACP roles are generic by their nature. What do you see the ACP role in physiotherapy profession in the future? physiotherapy profession in the future? I think there's, you know, a, in the MSK world, the first contact practitioners is a lot more established. Um, and I think being an ACP in a ward setting and a more sort of acute setting, um, 
is is a very different kettle of fish um and i think it's it's looking at how we can as i've mentioned incorporate those our core skills and i think it will vary slightly depending on what environment you work in because there are some physios who you know are work solely in hematology and so you could be up on a hematology ward and in that case you know it's looking at what maybe your your initial role is and what are you adding from a um from an like an advanced practice perspective to that role so i don't think there's one model that fits all um and you know as with nursing different people have different skill sets and different experience but i think there's work to be done to try and streamline the 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 core skills and how we can utilize those i think with frailty in particular there is a a big gap for for physios and acp roles because it, it gives us a very unique skill set and in terms of that discharge planning and having that confidence to say yep yeah, socially that person's you know sort of good to go um and so I think there's, like I said, there's work to be done and I don't quite know what what it looks like in the future. I still have the same vision that I'm working towards. Um, so hopefully in a couple of years time, I can come and say I've achieved the role I I, I want to, to do in terms of those assessments. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Yasmin. I think we probably need to move on to the, the next presentation now because we're just a bit short on time. Thank you. Okay. Um... Thank you, Jasmine. Our next presenter is going to be Kiran Katikaneni. And Kiran is a trainee advanced clinical practitioner in acute geriatrics at Posma Hospital. Over to you, Kiran. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I've started my career long ago, uh, much earlier than uh, Jasmine and others tonight. I've been um, actively pursuing uh, ACP role for the last at least eight to nine years. At the time, I work in I used to work in West Sussex, and the closest availability was in Nottingham, and that would have meant moving lock, stock, and barrel with young children and uprooting wife's career. I I didn't dare, and then it was not the apprenticeship model. It was. It was a MSc route, and then later you find your clinical placement and find clinical supervisors. So I didn't pursue even uh, that as one of the main reasons. And then I waited, and then I tried internally within the trust, but it never happened. And uh, one last row was um, other non -AH, non AHP colleagues were appointed in trainee roles, and I had to move on in search of new pastures. So I have joined this job last year. However, I've only started my master's MSc module, MSc proper three-year pathway last week from Bournemouth. Uh, that's where uh, my trust largely is attached to Portsmouth Hospitals, uh, Portsmouth University Hospitals Trust. Um, Brief background to ACP roles is that this is part of the, uh, you can see so many policies and, and plans from the NHS England. Five-year forward plan, long-term plan, people plan, workflow, workforce plan. It was, I think, uh, a, a noble intention to equip senior experienced clinicians in expanding their horizons and adding additional uh, skill sets, so to speak, to overcome the projected shortage of certain uh, specialist roles, but also to address the needs of the um, increasing population, certainly, but also aging population. We are living longer. The health span is much longer, let alone lifespan. So in order to do that, this was done and ACP roles have come up. Initially, ANPs, ACPs, there was a bit of uh, overlapping confusion, um, but now ACP generally is widely uh, acknowledged, widely um, understood. And as Jasmine said earlier, you, your, your role is based on those four pillars. And so to speak, uh, every AHP role, uh, every medical nursing role, those are the key pillars in any way. 
But I, I believe in ACP, Advanced Clinical Practice, they are embedded into you right from the beginning in order to uh, evidence your learning as per those four pillars and also the interla um, overlapping areas, but also demonstrate your evidence and collect your evidence in, in terms of uh, portfolio, your uh, modules along those lines so as to evidence your, your development. Um, and certainly this is a big uh, push in terms of apprenticeship uh, role, which is what I'm doing currently. The key aspect is a uh, high degree of autonomy, complex decision-making and building clinical partnerships, networking, and, and relying on those uh, um, communication skills. High degree of autonomy because uh, even during um, my current um, apprenticeship role, I do work independently, but constantly have that oversight by the consultant geriatrician and my line manager, who is an ACP of five year experience. However, they have, in a way, the, the focus is on uh, uh, fostering autonomy right from the very beginning. So again, th that is a key differentiation between ACP and non-ACP role. Next slide, please, Ellie. Yeah, sorry, Kieran. Unfortunately, I'm clicking and it's that's, not doing anything. That's okay. Um, I'm not sure why. I've just moved the uh, menu at the bottom just to see what the bottom bit was saying and uh, it seems to have not have liked me. Um, Could we go back and forth and see if it works? Yeah, it's not wanting to do that either. So. I, that's fine. I'll open my mobile screen. Sorry, I'll keep trying now. Yeah, okay. You could try to stop sharing, Ellie, and then reshare if that might work. Okay. It doesn't matter. I got on a different screen. That's okay. I'll catch up now, Kieran. So yeah, if you carry on. Okay. Yeah, we go. Thank you. We're back. <laughs> uh, I was mentioning earlier, one of the routes I chose is apprenticeship route. The others are Apple, which is the uh, accreditation of prior experiential learning. And then the master's. I have uh, met some, some peers and uh, my seniors, so to speak, who have done st standalone modules, MSc, under their own initiative and then started ACP job. That's also one of the routes. Uh, Apple is another route uh, and uh, apprenticeship. Again, you go through um, NHS England's um, sometimes, sometimes uh, bureaucratic that involves a bit of red tape. The, the reason I'm saying red tape is for that, uh, one needs um, a GCSE level two functional skills in English and mathematics. And returning to maths after years has proven a huge challenge for me personally. So for those of you who would like to do that, make sure you have level two, if not have a plan to achieve that. There is a lot of support from the trust who, uh, who support apprenticeship route. There, there are departments and, and people involved there. It's just uh, a hurdle. And for me, it proved to be a major hurdle, especially because of my innate aversion for mathematics. Uh, next slide, please. And this generally, and I think this might be evolving all the time. Um, when I when I went into this, this is what I went with uh, to to develop myself in the in thirty eight core capabilities, and that's uh, uh, that's promoted by the advanced practice uh, of uh, health. Uh, Health Education England, and they and as one of the speakers has put in uh, one uh, one of the audience members has put in a question. So a lot of times ACP role can be generic because those thirty eight core capabilities uh, can be um, um, uh, cross matched, can be transferable between different specialities, and then some. Uh, 
uh, some might need topping up. Some might need topping up through experiential learning or a module. But generally, once you you have done these third year core capabilities, I believe I understand it. It, it uh, helps you in in very good stead, and then you can explore the opportunities. Uh, currently, I'm doing in geriatrics and especially at the um, the front end, which is the uh, same day emergency care. That's where my job is based. But I tend to rotate through acute wards to get that side of experience as well. And working with different consultants, uh, AHPs and senior nurse, uh, clinical nurses. Next slide, please. Uh, career opportunities in older persons medicine. Again, I don't have to say this specifically. A lot of us know, you know, we are part of that uh, speci specialty. Uh, after doing ACP, again, this can open up enormous opportunities there. And one uh, particularly I'm interested in is to explore um, involvement in uh, Parkinson's management through um, outpatient clinics. Uh, historically, day hospitals existed. I haven't seen lately. In fact, my my fond memories are of the day hospital that I worked in, Mid Glamorgan in, in Bridgen, where I first started. And that was uh, a Parkinson's clinic. And, and that memories, I, it was an enormous learning curve for me. And the other one upcoming, especially in my trust, is orthogeriatrics. So again, the op opportunities, options can be endless. As, as it evolves, as the role evolves, and, and as the services expand um, and there's more funding available. I also put uh, consultancy again. Uh, you must have known a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of stars know Bhanu Ramaswamy, uh, Esther Clift, and, and, you know, the pioneers in our profession and especially in ger geriatric rehab. So they pursue those kind of roles. And again, there is so much to learn from their practice and, 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 and pursue career opportunities. Academic and research, um, almost all um, ACPs have some kind of teaching element. And uh, especially with our HP background, I, I believe it will be an asset because most of the ACPs still are nurses. So to have a, a senior clinical a physiotherapist might actually uh, increase their employability, um, but also add more depth and more uh, weight to the uh, to the cohort of ACP trainees coming from a clinical physiotherapist, coming from a clinical nurse, coming from a clinical param, param, paramedic personnel. So it gives that kind of... Uh, um, expansive um, experiential learning aspect to that. Next service, please. Next slide, please. Sorry. My key learning points so far, um, I have started this job uh, even before uh, joining the MSc because of some procedural delays and uh, and and, and uh, the delay in, in getting my uh, level two skills um, uh, through. But all the time I'm training on the job. So it has been a bonus and uh, it's really helping now because um, I'm more or less, I still don't believe it. And imposter syndrome stands on top of all, all the point, all the bullet points. My um, line manager keeps boosting my morale and confidence. It's it's the amount of work I do and, and my fellow trainee does to support the medical team. And a lot of times we don't talk about it, but it's felt. And it's felt because when we go back after a weekend or a day off, suddenly things come to head and or people come back and say they missed our presence, they missed because there was a complex case which needed a, a senior physio assessment. Uh, there are n number of examples um, that I can quote, and also recently, as Jasmine was mentioning, during the medical, the junior doctor strike, we were asked to flex our working week, and I, I jumped at the opportunity because we were there supporting the consultants and those who were at work, and that was uh, history taking, physical assessment, uh, formulating a plan, and then joining the consultants on the post take rounds. And then all the while starting the discharge summaries, which actually I've started to 
fall in love with them. Because now as a physio, as an AHP, I'm bringing that element to the discharge summaries, where in the past the contrast was very much medically led, medically driven and medical orientated. I'm making sure I, I include what their mobility was, what their uh, risk factors are, and include the social uh, history and add a sentence or two about that individual. Because the patients, the cohort I see is 85 plus and recently met a 102 year old gentleman. And these are veterans, they, they have life experience, they have enormous to offer. So I, I make sure I get one or two sentences about them to give that particular patient a more human rather than an individual patient with, a, with an NHS number. Um, I am, uh, um, I, I believe I'm instrumental in spreading the awareness um, because apart from me, there is just two more physios and they're in the critical care. And just by the definition, they are very well insulated from the rest of the hospital chaotic situation. So we, we other physios don't tend to see them often. But also the way the roles are funded, it's a di it's entirely different division. So therefore, it's very difficult to meet them, get to know them. But because my presence is on several wards and I make sure I rotate within uh, my uh, job spec, so I tend to meet different therapy teams and talk about um, ACP role and try and uh, raise awareness and inspire youngsters in choosing this career opportunity. Challenges, there are several, again, um, bridging the gap between two different worlds, but also maintaining that unique identity is, is quite key challenge. And I've learned it sometimes hard way in the very beginning. Uh, opportunities, again, pushing CGA, pushing clinical frailty scale, uh, pushing frailty management, deconditioning, big time. Now it has become more or less a very common currency in, in uh, same day emergency care. People talk so freely about it. And I, I've been in this uh, quite a long time, nearly 20 years now. So to see uh, physiotherapy for older persons taking such an important uh, place and uh, evolving into such a good role is quite heartening. Because all the while the frustrations was, uh, we are not funded, we are the Cinderella of the uh, specialist areas. Uh, we are not marked by any national um, uh, key performance indicator, therefore there's no funding. But it, it's it's getting better and future is bright, I would like to believe, and this is one way forward. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, the further reading, there's enormous uh, amount of information. I must say, uh, those of you who are aspiring um, must read the Agility from Spring 2021. It's the one with the beautiful lavender uh, front page cover. There are a lot of information, a lot of uh, very good stories, a lot of personal stories and success stories. And I, I, I really had it all the time, uh, knowing that one day I will pursue this career route. So that and uh, yeah, various other things. Any questions? Yeah, sorry, um, Kiran, thank you so much. Uh, well, the question is generally for all the panel. Any advice from the panel about e-portfolio e route for ACP? This seems to be my only optional route. And that's from Amy. Okay. Um, Jasmine, would you like to chip in or shall I start and you jump? Um, I mean, I don't know that much about the... Okay. E portfolio route particularly is something I've now I've completed my master's I <clears throat> have applied so they've they've brought in a digital badge for people that have got yeah. the training qualifications and I with my understanding was that e portfolio route was for sort of um verification of your previous training um and you need to have done the modules previously to sort of combine them but I might be wrong in that um. I'll, I'll say what I know, and Andrew and Rebecca can uh, join in. Uh, you, um, my view about ePortfolio, or my understanding is, 
there are various models floating around, but it hasn't been centralized yet. And that's where we were asked to wait uh, un until um, Health Education England has it, their own portal. Different trusts follow different uh, portals, but largely they're based on, if you have seen what the junior doctors use from the, uh, I think it's a joint Royal College uh, training board called Horus, but also there's another name. That's why there are quite a lot of models and they all follow the similar pattern. The point is you upload your reflective practice with uh, evidence where you discuss, for example, uh, there's a case-based discussion. And then you upload it for your clinical supervisor, your line manager or ACP supervisor within the trust to have access and read and comment on it and then agree and then uh, sign off. And then you need certain number in order to say, okay, you have achieved that competence. And that's, that's what I was talking in the beginning, 38 competences to achieve. But also we, we, are, we have started in my trust in Portsmouth, certainly I have started collecting uh, in still paper format, but it's, uh, it's on the computer, it's in MS Word format. Idea being just collect as much evidence as you can in whatever form you're comfortable with. And I use the uh, HCP, CCSP's reflective practice. So for example, what did you learn? Uh, uh, what were the key learning um, objectives? Uh, how it's going to help the service? How it's going to help um, the, the, the carer, you know, the patient's carer and family? And uh, yeah, so it's along those lines, uh, reflect and then save it. And then the idea is eventually, it can be transferable to the portfolio and fit into the relevant parts. Uh, sorry, if I'm, if I'm confusing you further, Lata. The idea is that uh, different trusts probably are following different. And as far as I know, there is no centralized format yet, but that's what Health Education England is trying to achieve. And I believe it will be done very, very soon. Thank you, Kieran. That's okay. Uh, just to uh, also know, I uh, mean, I believe apprenticeship role, apprenticeship pathway is one of the uh, better ones, not necessarily because others have uh, many disadvantages. It's because it's still it's so much support and uh, I am super numeric, so there's no expectation of me to be there eight hours a day. I, I flex, I attend the study uh, I mean, ongoing CPD activities that I think is relevant to my job, including going to the Schwartz rounds, uh, networking, uh, shadowing someone, and also flexing freely. So the constraints of a rota are not there. And generally, you're treated as a, as a learner, as a student, and, and that's a good feeling after being in the profession for a long time and constantly... Uh, being in a in a in a role that supports the rest of the team to to have that support for your own career progression, so I feel I feel this has an enormous potential, and government is pushing apprenticeship pathways big time. Thanks, Kieran. That's really informative. If we Thank could you. move on to on to the next presentation now, we're just a bit short on time. Thank you. Thank you, Kieran. Our next presenter is going to be Andrew Klein. And Andrew is a clinical force practitioner at Helder University Health Board. Over to you, Andrew. Hi. Um, nice to speak to everyone today. Um, as uh, I have imposter syndrome uh, during this meeting, let alone at work, um, because uh, I've qualified uh, a long time before most of the other people. Um, and have worked in um, band seven roles for uh, about 20 years or more. So um, my interest is in what is called translational research, that, that is putting established research into practice and spreading knowledge about that practice. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of an informal 10 minutes, especially if I start my stopwatch, on that subject that... Um, it is not part of uh, an ACP course 
or any um, development, planned development, but I've had a succession of um, posts where I've been the only physiotherapist uh, managing multidisciplinary teams or in a multidisciplinary team and usually managed and supervised by other professionals. Um, this has been quite a challenge. For instance, when I got my last job, I turned up on the first day and I was handed a nurse's uniform in a trust that doesn't wear nurses. You, you know, it's not a multidisciplinary uniform, but it's a nurse. And so that, yeah, that's the kind of challenge you get. Um, and I think it's a little bit like Kieran said, you know, my role has been bridging the gap between two different worlds. So I've brought some uh, knowledge and skills and teaching ability in terms of frailty and dementia and taken that into other settings. And um, I'm going to just talk through some of that. So in terms of my, I, I'm really, uh, I'm uh, sorry, Ali, if we, um, yeah, so I'll just go, I'm, just, I'm not going to use the presentation, Ali, I'm sorry, I've got. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I'll, I'll, leave I'll leave it on that screen. Um, if I jump to the most recent achievement and then I'll work backwards through my talk to be, so in 2021, Improvement Cymru, which is like public health in Wales, um, launched 20 dementia standards to improve the care of people newly diagnosed with dementia. One of them was on movement and mobility. And I was successful at being appointed to, to, to uh, lead on some of the first steps of that um, standard. So this is gave me more opportunities to roll out some of my uh, interest in, in how to altering your approach with dementia. So uh, um, prior to, so this started back in 2013 with an agility article so uh, believe it or not now I, i'm embarrassed to say uh you can't get that online because it was just before the internet was invented um so if you if you search um research gate andrew klein you can find a copy of this article because they're now like you know harry potter first edition it's, um you'll struggle otherwise and that laid out some some specific strategies for altering your approach when working with people with dementia. That's not for treating dementia, it's for treating hip, respiratory, stroke, back pain, whatever physios are treating, how can they alter their approach because the person's living with dementia? And um, so that uh, article uh, then developed into teaching at University of West of England in their physiotherapy under. Uh, course which I've been doing for um, uh, almost, over, uh, almost 10 years I think now um, it also led to a session which we developed or I developed on the induction program in wheelchair health and care and um, uh, then also um, we, I presented on this topic at the NPJ Paralysis Global Summit so it's about taking information which fundamentally was from the world of psychology about how to improve motor skill and translating that to physiotherapists. So this information has been presented. So Claire Leonard's been presenting on this topic at the CSP Congress. So that article from Agile back in 2013 was the first time this was written for a physio audience. Yeah, I didn't invent it. I didn't, I, I didn't discover it. It's just translational research in terms of taking uh, evidence that we already know about how to develop motor skill and applying it to a different setting. Um, so um, uh, in terms of my jobs, I was originally, at the time it started, I was working in older adult mental health services as a band six physio. I then became a team manager in the therapy teams, um, which was managing a team which had one physio, which was me. So I was managing psychologists and, and uh, OTs mainly and other people. Um, then I was a community team manager in wheelchair health and care. So again, it was managing a team which had physios in it, but it included things like the EST, the stroke team and in uh, ICT beds, but the main profession was 
district nurses. So mm -hmm. I was managing a team which where 40% of the staff were district nurses. And then latterly, I had a job as a uh, um, clinical falls practitioner in Helva, which is a health board in West Wales. Um, there's three counties. I'm, I'm the, uh, myself and a nurse is the falls practitioner uh, in, uh, in Pembrokeshire. There's two of us. We're both band sevens. The job was advertised in a way that made it look like it was a nursing job. It was in as part of the nursing directorate. And people sort of say, are you employed as a physiotherapist? And I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't know how I would find that. You know, I'm employed in the nursing directorate. Uh, and I go and I'm invited to all kinds of meetings, which most of which um uh, what's the diplomatic word of this? Uh, relate to sort of areas I'm not working in, sort of cath care, pressure over care, things like that. So currently, I'm doing a we we have a structured multifactorial falls assessment, and we carry that out with people who are at risk of falls, and we we set out a course of uh, interventions to manage that person's risks. If we can solve them in one visit, we do. So we can order equipment, we can give them a home exercise program, but more often we, we then refer on and we create a pathway for people who are falling at home. So this is either the ambulance service have seen them and left them at home, or um, they are uh, referred by other people like social workers, um, uh, sheltered housing managers, uh, care home managers, people like that. They don't need a they don't need consultants' input, but they need a multi multifactorial assessment because we're not sure why they're falling over. So that's like my role currently. In terms of qualifications, so apart from physiotherapy, I did an MSc in exercise and health sciences at Bristol University. So that was, uh, you know, I was I was lucky enough to get on that uh, alongside the NHS, but it wasn't within my, you know, I was given study leave to do it, but I wasn't within the, the NHS itself. I think now it's harder to get on those kind of courses as part of a job. And then Mary Seacole NHS leadership uh, diploma with the Open University. And that was a very interesting way because it's about putting uh, change into practice. And I think the weakness of many people's ideas are they never actually see five years down the road, see uh, they're, they're not put into practice in a permanent way. So that course was really helpful to me in, in although it was a leadership course, it helped me put my ideas into practice. Um, the, um, an example of this is we, uh, uh, we had, we had the challenge with how to spread the message about altering your approach with dementia. So if we just go through a couple of more slides early, so if you just, so, uh, and again there, so just stop, that's fine. Just stop there. So about 30% of your caseload, whether that be beds, patients in A&E, uh, outpatient community teams caseload, you know, it will vary between 20% and 60% will have dementia and cognitive impairment um, or should have that. Uh, dementia and cognitive impairment are negative variables to recovery. A lot of people, including physios, mix it up. So we just got to the next slide, Ellie. So negative variable is a consideration not an exclusion criteria the easiest way to think about this is age uh, i'm old enough to remember stroke units who refuse to have people over the age of 70 in them so age is a negative variable it should not be an exclusion criteria so rob burrows who who was the rugby league player had motor neuron disease was five foot six which uh, is a negative variable for being a professional rugby player but it's not exclusion criteria. So if you have 100 people with dementia, they will do slightly worse on hip surgery. Same as 100 people in their 90s will do slightly worse for hip surgery. But there's lots of other uh, negative variables, including uh, uh, educational status, postcode, all sorts of things. We should not be using negative variables 
as exclusion criteria. And so spreading that kind of message is one of the things that I've done in my work, because I feel we should, in the NHS, we should be doing almost the opposite way around. We should, the people with all the positive variables least need physio's time. And we should be really focusing on people with negative variables. So I thought I would give you a little kind of slightly more uh, random and unstructured view of my uh, my employment and uh, edu my background and my experience. But I've, I've been quite happy to sort of spread messages that I feel passionate about um, through that time. And I found ways to do that, although they tend to be within sort of older adult mental health or community health services, not traditional physio teams. And believe it or not, I have not had a direct line manager who is a physiotherapist in the last 30 years, I think, 25 years. So, um, you know, it is possible outside. When you see the job, if it's vaguely interesting, apply for it, even if it looks not like a physio job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. I think we'll go on to the last presentation and then if there's any questions for for you, Andrew, we'll incorporate in that if that's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Our next presentation is going to be coming from Rebecca Fain, who is an advanced clinical practitioner at Hertfordshire and Worcestershire Health and Care NHS Trust. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, I'm just waiting to see if the slides are going to work. Ah, yes, I can see them. Go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good start, isn't it? Um, so, yes, apologies for the long and wordy trust that I belong to. It's quite awkward to say, isn't it? Um, so that's just my details on the front slide there. So we can go to the next one. Um, so my journey so far, um, I qualified as a physio in 2007. And my first two physio roles were always community hospital and then community-based physio roles so fully clinical um, as a band five and band six which is where I kind of started my interest in working with older people and I think probably have been a member of Agile ever since those days um, so it's a well-loved um, special interest group for me. Um, I'm a bit different to some of the people that have done um, an ACP training in that I kind of started looking at further study um, back in 2015 and did my master's, um, unlike Kieran, who's obviously doing um, a very kind of supported um, role with his master's. I did mine self-funded, very part-time, and it took six years to get there. Um, so I did my modules in between having two children, getting married, swapping jobs. And I'm, I suppose I'm just floating it out there as it is a way of doing things. Um, not necessarily I'd recommend it all, all together, but it is a different way of doing things if life kind of gets in the way and, and actually you can't get into a role um, to be an ACP. Um, hopefully the world has changed a little bit now and there's a lot more roles out there. Um, so, yeah, as I say, I was a community clinical physio and I wanted to do a job. Then once I'd got all this new knowledge and these skills and, and kind of worked hard on the masters and done a dissertation where I could use everything, but also remain clinical. So um, staying in the same trust that I've worked for um, several years, I was able to find a developmental ACP role, which suited me perfectly because, of course, I'd not worked in an ACP role while doing the masters. So that allowed me that scope, not quite supernumerary, but allowed that kind of training year I would say to kind of really consolidate where where I'd got to on the the official training course but also then expand actually what did this job look like so I think it was yeah about six months later started my prescribing training um, in independent prescribing v300 and finished that last September and have been a kind of fully qualified ACP since then so if we go to the next slide um, so my current role, I work in inpatient, so I've kind of gone full circle back to where I started as a band five, which is nice in a way. It's kind of, um, yeah, it's just how, how, how different things work, isn't it? So that's a nurse-led unit. Um, so it's community hospital. So we have seven of them in Worcestershire and five of them are ACP led with the medical model and management day to day. So I don't know if the term is used elsewhere, but it's known as pathway two. So it's the um, inpatient rehab 
referrals that come from the acute trusts, um, so from the wards at the acute trust or a &E at the acute trusts, or directly through SPA, um, single point of access for GPs if they need to admit people from community, um, home, home base. I'm part of a small team of ACP physio and nurse colleagues, and then we have GPs and a geriatrician for our medical um, oversight as well. So my day-to-day -day role is medical management and assessment of patients. So we largely, the, the ACPs do most of the clerking of those patients and we do the prescribing, we do the drug charts, we do um, all the kind of assessments that come with, with that. Then alongside any new patients on the ward, we would do the prescribing tasks and reviews. Um, so work hand in hand with pharmacy colleagues within um, the teams as well to kind of look at different reviews and, and things that they suggest. We support GPs with the ward rounds and sometimes lead on them if there isn't a GP that day, actually it will be ACP led with the ward rounds. And then we may just kind of gather things that need a GP or a medic to have a look at further. We complete the MDT meetings with the other ward staff. So that gives you a really good um, chance to kind of discuss why a medical reason might keep someone in the bed a bit longer, but actually hear from your colleagues about the social and the therapy um, aspects and goals that everyone's working towards together. I complete respect forms with all patients on admission. Um, and if they're not happy to have a form in place at that time, we um, start that discussion. If it's a completely brand new concept to them, then it's a really important part of what we do. So these people have largely, I would say 95% come from an acute hospital. Um, and so it's just having that importance about, do they want to go back to that acute hospital? If they change, if their health changes with us, what, what's the plan? And also knowing that hopefully most people are going home from us or going back to a care home or nursing home, even if it is a change of uh, where they've come from, just knowing that that plan is, is there and that we've actually addressed that and started that conversation if it's not already in place. The patient group is largely over 80 um, with comorbidities, frailty, and a lot of complex social family factors that we see. So probably similar to a lot of um, the, the speakers today. And we'll go to the next slide, please. So I've just done a little bit about what can a physio bring to the ACP role. Probably could have talked, couldn't we, on this for kind of half an hour each, uh, each of us. So I think, you know, we're really strong communicators. We know that as physios. We're used to the joint work with family and patients around future planning. And I think that that just lends itself to an ACP role when you're a physio by background. I love the fact that it's a hands-on role and I'm still fully clinical. So um, everyone's got their different pathways in physio and, and their career kind of direction changes as, as the years go on and different opportunities. Where I work particularly, it's not, not you know the only option, but it felt like there was only going to be a band seven team leader role if I wanted to advance in terms of either you know financially or just in banding, there, there wasn't a lot out there um, to kind of look to what I'd want to do and still stay clinical. So it gave me that opportunity in this role. Obviously we've got that background knowledge, you know, inside out of the pain, biomechanics, the impact of that on mobility, the understanding of falls, history, balance issues in this patient group, frailty, hopefully addressing the causes for that person um, and the potential to reverse that process and, and kind of, you know, we do a lot of things like deprescribing, which was completely alien to me until I started the ACP training and and then further with the prescribing training and just about how much of an impact that can have on people. Um, the awareness of the impact of social situation on future progress and rehab, you know, as physios, we're just so well sighted on actually the impact of that holistic part of, of that patient's picture and what they're going back to at home and what home's going to look like. Uh, we've got that practical head, we love problem solving, and we're used to already working in an MTT, whatever role we're in at the moment. Um, you know, that that's what we do, and, and that doesn't come difficult to us. So next slide, please. So my reflection so far, as I say, I'm kind of getting on for two and a half years into the role, um, a year as a kind of qualified a to a ACP. So my role has changed sort of in the last year being a prescriber that has brought, you know, challenges and, and benefits to my clinical practice. As I've said earlier, it was, it's been brilliant to be able to remain a fully clinical member of staff. I can continue to extend skills in an area I'm passionate about that, that literally never stops. I don't think I've had 
so much learning in such a short space of time, which I'm so, sure some of the others will concur with um, in, in the many years. Um, and that, that you know, that is sometimes hard work, but it, it's really enjoyable. I'm able to use my prescribing skills every day. And I know that some physio prescribers, they don't get such support with that. So either in their workplace or from, um, you know, kind of just a practicality point of view, I know I've spoken to some physios who've done literally exactly the same training, but for whatever reason, the, the you know, the powers that be where they work aren't allowing them to use even their formulary that they they first um, were kind of signed off from university. So I think it, it's it's a good reflection of kind of the team and the, the, the service that I work that I'm able to use that skill every day. I love working with older adults and frailty and I feel like we can really make a difference um, with that physio knowledge and working within the MDT to kind of promote that rehab and that real real kind of goal working as a team. Challenges, I'll, I'll be completely honest. So like some of the other speakers have said, I wouldn't say I use my traditional physio hands-on skills day to day. So the medical model is the priority. So the patients, are, they come into the service and their, their medical need is the main priority. And that is the main skill in which I use um, day to day. And at times the work can feel quite subacute in an area that I'm less confident in. So deteriorating patients was quite a shock to start with when I first started the role. So, you know, there isn't a doctor on site um, every day. And that that is something that you are there to manage and the, the rest of the ward staff look to you to manage. And I just scribbled um, earlier when I was kind of reading back through my slides, you know, Literally on day one, I was expected to manage every problem to do with diabetes, every problem to do with a wound, um, you know, at the other end of the scale, you know, the dying patient and the family and the the dynamics that come with that. And that was all, although I'd done training, I'd done, you know, placements as part of my health assessment and prescribing. It's still another another big jump, isn't it? And a, a bit of a kind of learning curve with with lots of things. So future opportunities, we're really lucky um, in that actually physios keep coming into our team. So there was one colleague um, when when all this first started, I joined at the same time as another colleague. So we added went one to three and then a fourth about a year ago. And then we've just had another physio join. So in a team of, I want to say about 20 people, we've now got five physios. So I think the future is bright in that we can try, hopefully, although the medical mod model is, you know, always going to be a priority to a certain degree, we want to look more into the assessments that we can enhance within the team and the teaching we can do within the team and the ward teams about why we go on so much about the falls, the dizziness, the postural hypertension and the impact of this. And then the hopefully changing that kind of revolving door of the patients that keep coming back in. Um, and then other areas that we just want to expand on a kind of bone health, medication, nutrition and understanding the impact of all those things recovering when patients are recovering from illness there's loads of scope to keep growing clinically and you know research base and, and lots of things out there so it's just you know as ever time and, and and trying to coordinate those things so I think that's that was my last slide thank you for listening Thanks, Rebecca. It's just whether we've got any other the questions. questions. Yeah, I think there's a yeah. couple of questions. If I just ask and that those questions are just um uh, addressed to everyone. What would your considerations be for looking at an ACP role over an extended scope practitioner? Um I I'll, I'll start in, um, my fellow peers can join in. I, I think this job spec is uh, very different, although there will be a lot of overlapping. And although the ACP emphasizes on four pillars, those four pillars are not exclusive to ACP role. Uh, in fact, as, a, as an undergraduate physio, we have those pillars embedded but sometimes they're not promoted in that fashion or not at the same level of emphasis is placed on them. Uh, but I think in ACP, those are clear cut um, uh, for governing clinical, uh, for pillars, and all your work is supposed to be designed around it in terms of evidencing and promoting those four pillars. 
Uh, I'm sure ESP roles also do to some extent. So does clinical specialist roles. They all, I, I believe for a reason, are banded at 8A because of similarities by and large. I mean, for me, it will be a difficult question to answer. As an ACP, I see as um, more autonomy. And um, I, I think one of the key uh, uh, principle when policymakers, the government decided it was just no matter what clinical area you're an expert in or you're specialized and experienced in, you bring that and add to the the traditional medical model. And I, I can already see that working in my practice, even though I, I'm, I'm still a year one trainee, I can already see that shaping the future um, profession that we are in. I'm not sure if it answered. I think um, from my sort of side of things, there's from an extended scope perspective, there's um, that's been more typically sort of within musculoskeletal physio that you've got, you know, your enhanced scope and, and stuff there. And as um, Kieran said, I don't think extended scopes necessarily worked, worked to the four pillars. Um, we have uh, like, a, uh, extended scope practitioners working in our urgent treatment center and I think the key differentiation I would say there is that the extended scope practitioners are a lot more protocol and pathway led and driven whereas the advanced clinical practitioners are a lot is a lot more about uh, your clinical reasoning um, and not to say that ESPs don't use clinical reasoning but you would go through and and do you think we get referrals from our urgent treatment centre where they say the pathway says this, we have to do this, or we can't see this patient because it doesn't fit the remit of their role, whereas an advanced clinical practitioner, their the scope is slightly more extended, I think, if that if that helps at all. Thank you. I'm just going to take a couple more questions because I'm being mindful of the time. Um, and my question to Rebecca is, have you seen your role expedited pathway to discharges from the community setting, Rebecca? Um, we, it's, it's mainly acute discharges to us. Um, so as I said, it, it's, it's not usually community patients that come in and therefore, um, it's still kind of the MDT focus. So it's the therapy goals, it's the social work intervention that's needed. And then, and we're part of the, the kind of MDT team. So I think that's a difficult one in that it probably doesn't reflect any difference from me as an ACP physio, if I'm honest, to an ACP nurse and the team doing the role that we do with that side of things, because I think it depends on the therapy goals and, and what's going on with that patient. Um, but I think it's definitely an area where within the the time that the patient's on the ward, we could definitely look at projects for what enhances their care there and, and what's better or different about seeing a physio for some of your reviews than, than a different discipline, really. Thank you. I think one last question, it's supposed to everyone. Um, do you all wear your physio uniforms in ACP roles or do you all wear your ACP uniforms and be physio in disguise? I'm a, a physio in disguise. I wear um ACP uniform. Oh, yeah, about... me too. <laughs> yeah, I'm disguised. In in my trust still there is no uh, set uniform, so we wear scrubs purely for practical reason, ease of change and access, and also to um clearly set the expectations and and not to be confused with the therapy colleagues. Um, we in, probably this is post COVID, um, post pandemic lockdown um, across the country. Um, the format we all have colored lanyards, so from a distance we can tell based on the lanyard, even though all of them are in either blue or uh, maroon uh, scrubs. It's the lanyard that stands out, and certainly, yeah, your your name and your title. I wear physio uniform. Oh, <laughs> that's, the, that, that's the advantage. I started the 
uh, two weeks before lockdown. So um, okay, <laughs> uh, no one was arguing about uniforms at that time. <laughs> Least of the priority. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, just to, just to add, uh, I do make a point to tell all my patients that I'm not a doctor, whether right or wrong. And also recently, unfortunately, a lot of uh, PAs have been at the receiving end, uh, rightly or wrongly, sometimes driven in the uh, social media. Um, but not my, not just that, even right from the beginning, to clearly demarcate the role, expectations, and also sometimes the, the patient's attitude changes, uh, the carer's attitude changes. So that to set the expectations right from the beginning. And I say, I work with the medical team, I'll come back with a consultant to see you again. And I'm a physio by background. So I never forget that the, the, the root identity that I belong to. So again, it opens them up and especially uh, typically Andrew's clients who have, who have false history, Parkinson's, they open up and, and they probably tell us more information and that's key to the history taking. Thank you, everybody. Um, so, yeah, a huge thank you to you all tonight, Jasmine, Kieran, Andrew, and Rebecca. Um, it's been great and very inspiring to hear about your careers and thinking about, you know, yeah, physio in a, in a different light. And it's been brilliant. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, um, we do have some vacancies on our committee at Agile at the moment. So we've got a vacancy with the communication officer, the agility editor, the student officer, and with informed Fold and Bone Health. So I've been a new member to Agile to the um, committee this year. So I'd highly recommend getting involved and being part of a passionate and knowledgeable team. Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for tonight and have a good evening. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you.